A function is a mapping from inputs to outputs. When we apply a function to an argument, we use that argument as the input and compute the output value. A simple function in OCaml is the built-in successor function, which maps integers to the integer that comes next. In other programming languages, you might be used to applying a function by using the function name and then the argument to the function in parentheses. In OCaml, we'll instead follow the notation used by Alonzo Church in the lambda calculus. Since functions and the applications of functions are so central to computation, we omit the extra parenthetical notation and instead apply a function just by specifying the name of the function followed by its argument. For example, we take the successor of 41 by naming the successor function and then providing the argument 41, no need for parentheses. The function is applied to 41, and we get the integer value 42 as output. And this makes sense, given the type of the successor function. If we enter the name of the function alone without applying it to any argument, we can see that the type of the function itself is int to int. Remember that we interpret this type as meaning the function takes an integer as input and returns an integer as output. In OCaml, functions take exactly one argument. That may be surprising if you're used to other programming languages where it's possible for a function to take multiple arguments. It turns out, though, that this isn't much of a limitation on the programming system because functions are themselves values. So let's take a look at how that works. Let's say we wanted to write a function to take the maximum of two integers. In other programming languages that allow multi-argument functions, we might call the function on two integer inputs and get back an integer output that is the maximum of the two inputs. But in OCaml, functions can only take one argument. So how could we think about this function? Well, remember that the type of a function in OCaml is the input type, an arrow, and then the output type. This function can't just be an int to int function, since that type describes a function that takes one integer as input and produces one integer output. Instead, we'll write the type of this function as int arrow, int arrow int. This type describes a function that accepts an integer as input and returns as output a new function that itself accepts an integer as input and returns an integer output. In other words, this function accepts arguments one at a time. It accepts the first argument and returns a new function that accepts the second argument rather than accepting both arguments simultaneously. This idea, known as currying a function, allows us to simulate functions that take multiple arguments in a language where functions only take single arguments. And it turns out currying will allow other benefits that aren't possible when arguments are all taken simultaneously, as we'll see later in the course too. Currying is used extensively in OCaml, and the language constructs help us to use it. These parentheses in the type of the function, for example, aren't necessary. Since the arrow type expression operator is right associative, we could equivalently write this type as int arrow int arrow int with no parentheses. But still, this isn't a function that takes two integer inputs simultaneously. It's a function that accepts a single integer input and returns a new function that takes an integer input and returns an integer as output. To use a function like this, we'd provide the name of the function and apply it to the first argument. That expression returns a new function. So we'd take this new function and apply it to a second argument, and then we'd get back an integer result. OCaml makes function application left associative, so we don't actually need parentheses around this first function application. We can separate the arguments with just spaces. This makes OCaml functions look similar to functions that take arguments simultaneously, but it's important to remember that in reality, functions like these take their two arguments one at a time. And there's no reason we need to stop at two arguments. We could write functions that take as many arguments as we'd like one at a time. Here's an example for the type of a function that takes one integer input and returns a new function that takes a second integer input and returns a new function that takes a third integer input and then returns an integer as output. 
we've actually already seen functions that work in this curried fashion. Let's go back to the operators we used when first working with values and types. The addition operator, for example, adds two integers together and produces a third integer. This operator, like many other operators in OCaml, we generally use infix, with the operator placed between its arguments. But if we take the operator and place it in parentheses, we can use the operator as a regular prefix function. Prefix because the function name comes before the argument. What's the type of this addition operator? It's int to int to int. In other words, it's a function that takes an integer as input and returns a function that takes a second integer as input and returns the sum. If we try applying the addition operator to a single integer, you'll see that what we get back returned is not an integer. It's a new function of type int to int. It's a function that's waiting for us to provide the second integer as input, and then it will output the sum. So if we then take this new function and apply a second argument to it, we get the sum of these two integers. And again, the parentheses here aren't really necessary. But here, as just a reminder that the functions take these integers one at a time. So now that we've talked about what functions are in OCaml and how to use them, let's talk about how to define your own functions. In OCaml, we can define a function with this construct, fun var arrow expression. This defines a function that accepts a variable as input, and after the arrow is an expression that might use the input variable, and that expression defines what the output of the function will be. So for example, we could define a function like fun x arrow x times 2. This is a function that accepts an integer input x and returns the value of x times 2, doubling the input. OCaml can infer the types for the input and output of this function, but sometimes it can be helpful to write down the types explicitly to make our intentions clear. To do that, we could add a colon and an int to indicate that this function will return an int. We could also add a typing for the argument x itself to explicitly note that the input argument x is also an int. If we enter this function into the OCaml REPL, we'll see that its type is int arrow int, which is what we'd expect. The function takes an integer as input and produces an integer as output. If we surround the function in parentheses, we can apply it to an integer argument and see that the function does indeed double the argument. This is an example of what we'd call an anonymous function. We've defined a function, but the function doesn't have a name, so we'd have no way of referring back to it later. But we have a solution to this. In the last chapter, we saw how we could use let expressions to give names to values. Since functions are values in OCaml, we can use let expressions to name our functions. To give a global name to this doubling function, we could write let double equal fun x arrow x times 2, and now we can use this name later anytime we want to use the double function. This method for giving names to functions works, but it actually ends up being a bit verbose. Given how central functions are in OCaml, the language gives us a simpler syntax for defining functions as well. We can simply write let the function name, followed by its argument, equal the expression. No need for the fun keyword and the arrow symbol. These two ways of naming the function both have the same effect, but the latter is more concise, especially as we start working with multi-argument curried functions. To define the maximum function we discussed earlier, for example, we could define a new function that accepts an input x and then an input y, and then returns the maximum of the two. But this is really just a simplified syntax for what's really happening, which is that the maximum function is a function that takes x as input and returns a new function that takes y as input and returns the maximum of x and y. This maximum function has type int to int to int, which we could provide explicitly as a good practice to make our intentions clear. But how would we do that for the compact notation for the function? For each of the arguments x and y, we can individually note that their types should be int. But we also ideally should provide the type for the result of calling maximum on values for x and y. We can do that by adding another colon after the last argument, and then providing the type for the return value. 
Now we've explicitly typed this function to indicate that it takes an integer x and then an integer y and then returns a value of type int. Let's take a look at one more example of a function that we could define in OCaml. Let's define a function for calculating the factorial of a number, which we get by multiplying all of the positive numbers up to that number. 4 factorial, for example, is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 24. 5 factorial, meanwhile, is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 120. Notice that contained within the expression we've written for 5 factorial is the expression we've written for 4 factorial. So 5 factorial is really just 5 multiplied by 4 factorial. And that's true for other numbers as well. 4 factorial is 4 multiplied by 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 3 multiplied by 2 factorial. 2 factorial is 2 multiplied by 1 factorial. And 1 factorial is 1 multiplied by 0 factorial, since 0 factorial we define as equal to 1. This gives us a recursive mathematical way to define the factorial function. We know that 0 factorial equals 1, which is what we'll generally call our base case. And we also know that for n greater than 0, n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial. Given that definition, let's try to write an OCaml function to calculate the factorial of a non-negative number n. We'll define the factorial function fact and have it take an integer argument n, and note that its output will be an integer as well. We have two cases to consider. First, if n is 0, then we just return 1. Otherwise, if n is not 0, then we'll return n multiplied by the factorial of n minus 1. This makes sense, but if we try to use this function in OCaml, we're going to get an error. Our use of fact is unbound, and that's to be expected. In a let expression in OCaml, we can't use the name we're defining, in this case fact, in the definition for the name itself. It's out of scope there. But in this case, we actually want the name fact to be in scope in the definition, since we're trying to use the name recursively. We can achieve this by adding the keyword rec after the let. By using let rec, we can recursively refer to the name fact inside the definition of fact itself. We do need to be a little bit careful when defining recursive functions. If we have a recursive function that always calls itself in all branches of the computation, then if we were to run the function, we'd get a stack overflow due to recursion that would go on forever if the computer didn't run out of memory first. So we always want to make sure that our recursive function will eventually stop recursively invoking itself. In the case of our factorial function, as long as we provide it with a non-negative input, eventually we'll keep calling the function with smaller and smaller inputs until we hit zero and the recursion ends. As we start writing our functions, it's going to be important for us to verify that our functions are correct. How could we do that? One strategy is unit testing, systematically evaluating our code on known inputs, making sure that the code behaves the way we expect. We could test our functions manually in the REPL. After writing our factorial function, we could test a variety of inputs to the function and verify that they all have the value we expect. They should all be true, otherwise we know something's gone wrong. But manually testing the function in this way isn't ideal, since we'll want to test our code any time we make changes to it. Instead of coming up with and writing out tests every time we make changes to our function, we can write some unit testing code for testing our factorial function, so that any time we make changes to the factorial function, we can just rerun the unit testing code to verify that the function still works. Here's an auxiliary function that will help us with some unit testing. It accepts a test as input, which produces a Boolean value, true if the test passed and false if it failed. It then accepts a message as an argument, describing what the test is verifying. We use the printf function in OCaml to print out whether the test passed or failed. Now we can use the auxiliary unit testing function to test some sample inputs to our factorial function. Here's a function called factTest that will call the unit test function repeatedly on a variety of different inputs, comparing those inputs to the expected output. When we run the factTest function, 
the function will test our factorial function against all of these known inputs and outputs and verify that the outputs are correct. Printed to the terminal, we'll see whether the tests passed or failed, helping us to verify that our code is correct. Of course, we can only trust this verification if our testing has been thorough. It's not possible to test the factorial function on all possible inputs, but it's good practice to test on as wide a range of cases as possible to increase our confidence that the functions we write in OCaml are correct.